the 2017 cohort of the uh, Allied TV Writers Studio program. Uh, there, hopefully the terror in them is somewhat masked because they're only about what, three weeks away from graduation? Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, so they got a lot of work left. But the good news is they will be coming out with Masters of Fine Arts degrees. And with great. any luck, your Masters of Fine Arts degrees in TV writing and producing. Okay, and with any luck, you're looking at least part of the next generation of showrunners. Okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Let me add them, Mitch. Yeah, Dave, decide how much you yeah. want to school them and how much you want to suck up to them. <laughs> because at some point, the, um, the employment tables will change. <laughs> <laughs> We're all going to be working for Aiden. Oh, okay. that's the side note. Hey, so, so Dave, let's start out with a really basic question, because as I told you, this is a real hands-on program. They have a lot of experience with their own writing and one another's doing individual and collaborative projects. More so than I think other TV programs in the country. It totally froze. Oh, there we go. Yeah, hold on, hold on. Hold on. Technical problems on this end. Okay. Hello. I can sort of hear you now, Mitch, but I can't see you. Oh, oh. No. Um, we, can we can see you. See you. We can see you. How do I look? Oh, I think I just got you back, but now you're pretty digital. That's okay. All right. Who's that, hi who's that hiding in the upper left? Wait. Is that me? <laughs> um, to his... Hey, Wait, look, I'm, oh, I see I'm hands. The guy, she is. There's I'm the guy who used to live across the hall from you. What's that? I'm the guy who used to live across the hall from you. No, I know that. <laughs> There's a girl across from you who kind of peeked. No, no, no. I see you back there. The one. Oh. There you go. Now I see you. Oh. Hi there. All right. All right. <laughs> so what, what you had started to say was, yeah, maybe that'll help a little bit, Mitch. Yeah, hold on. Hold on. There you go. Oh, there's even another person. Look at that. Good. Okay, Dave, so before we get to the pilot process in particular, uh, how do you describe the way you see the job of TV director in terms of working with writer producers? That's a big question. What, um, what, I mean, just to specify, Mitch, are you talking about creating a new show or working on an existing show? Let, let's start with working on an existing one, because let's assume that these folks will hopefully follow the somewhat traditional path of selling scripts episodically, eventually getting staff work, rising through the ranks, and then one day they can do their own show. So let's just start with sort of episodic relationships. Um, and, and, and I'll sort of go, and if it, if it becomes too basic, you know, stop me, Mitch. If there's things that they've already been exposed to or things you've taught them or, or other speakers who have, you know, Giving them the groundwork for what I'm about to say, interrupt me so that I'm not, you know, wasting anyone's time. Because these guys got to graduate, they got to get writing. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's it's a great question, you know. And I I don't I don't know how much Mitch had a chance to tell you about me, but I sort of have followed a, a somewhat traditional path in television. In that, 
you know, as Mitch said, many of you will follow what might be kind of a traditional path, although re there really is none uh, in television and Hollywood in general, but one where you have sort of an apprenticeship working under uh, a showrunner. Um, and there's a similar path to a degree, uh, or at least there's one version of a path for television directors, which is starting out working episodically. And so for a number of years, I did a number of episodes any given year, anywhere between eight and 10 and a pretty busy year of episodes that would, um, between prepping and shooting and posting could be anywhere between three or four weeks. And for me, I saw myself coming in during that time um, and taking creative ownership to a degree of that particular episode, but at the same time, ultimately knowing that my episode was meant to be just, or not just, but was meant to be one in a um, season of episodes. And whether that show is serialized or procedural, I'm assuming you know the difference between the two. Um, yeah. You know, I felt that I had to go in and either, in the case of the homeland, be fully aware of what came before me. And to the extent that the writers or showrunner knew and or was willing to share, usually they were if they knew, where the show was going so that I could make sure that there was a seamless tr transition from the end of the episode that preceded mine and the episode um, that followed mine. and. It's an interesting balance, um, I th and, I, and I think showrunners who um, uh, really understand that I think they're very effective at what they do are actually seeking a director to come in and bring his or her opinion and point of view and strengths and weaknesses to a given episode. But again, it's, it's, it's balancing that with also making sure that what you're do, doing is um, repeating a template and making sure that there's enough familiarity with your episode, with all the episodes that have come before and all that follow. So I really see myself as someone who's maintaining the vision of that particular episode within the greater confines of the series in that capacity. Before, before we hop to pilots and new ideas and shows, any questions about episodic stuff? Um, well, I, I'm Taylor. Uh, Tip went totally digital. Um, I was wondering just about something you just said about we're not willing. You with us, Dave? Eh? No, froze. Sorry. Good thing. I feel. I, I'm glad I told her to get on camera because I knew she was going to have a question. I could tell. <laughs> you know, I was asking. You said you had directors who didn't want to. They want you to come in and work with them, but they don't want to tell you what direction the story is going to go in. How did that work? Well, I really should. That really has never happened in the case with me. I, I've always found that with the directors, most writers, if they know where the show is going. Um, are, are all too willing to share. Uh, it's more been a case of not whether or not they actually know. Um, and I don't say that um, in any judgmental way. I mean, there are some, sh there's, there's, there is that. It's so funny. I was with, a, I have a property, a Spanish format that a producing friend and I are, um, that one of the studios bought, bought on our behalf. And we've been interviewing with different writers to actually, you know, bring them in to write the show. And uh, we met a guy who was one of the creators and has been working on the show The Last Ship for the last several years. And he, he, he was very clear that he really didn't know where the show was going uh, each season. They kind of knew that, and I, I'm not really that familiar with the show myself, but I know enough about it that, the, uh, you know, just quickly in its first season, it was a show about a aircraft carrier or something like that that was out at mission and then while they were out there's a pandemic or something like that that affected the whole world and they saved the world and they knew that that was not going to last longer than a year and so they really kind of ended up developing a technique where they were basically world building each year that of the five seasons that i think the show will ultimately have run um 
So every, and what's really kind of fun and exciting is it's all changing so much and that there are so many different um, uh, structures and methodologies of storytelling that people are embracing both studios, networks, and even audiences. So that part of it really fun. Um, I worked with, you know, I worked with another guy who I did a show for a number of years called American Dreams, where when I came on, the, the creator and writer with whom I became partners, he, you know, he knew that over, he had sort of a loose five-year plan for this show that was about a family that, you know, went through the 60s that he really wanted to start. And we did start the pilot ultimately with the, the um, assassination of JFK. And his mind, we didn't get there, but his mind was that at the end of the five years, the last thing we would see was um, Nixon uh, saluting as he was getting on the plane after, you know, resigning, uh, after getting an Air Force One. Um, you know, I, William Goldman, I don't know if you've ever read either of his books, and I don't know if this came out as one of his books, but he, you know, made this great comment about writing, and I think it's applicable to series television as well, which is, you know your beginning and your end, and uh, the, the movie, bec you know, the movie becomes about how you get from one to the other. And I've always been really intrigued by writers who have a larger sense what they want to do, but allow the contributions of the other writers, directors, actors, the audience participation, the studio or network to continue to inform them. So I think there's a mistake with being, or did I freeze? No, you Oh, you know, I think there's a mistake with being too rigid and being too planned out. And I think there's a mistake with having no clue. Um, so for me, I think there's always, and it's, it's frankly the most enjoyable, allowing what you're doing to actually have an influence on what it is you're doing. Um, hi, I'm Josh, we spoke earlier. Um, oh, you were wearing that. So is it a unique, I am, it's, it's a different one. Um, is it a unique thing then for someone like, um, like Pam Fryman to be the director on High Like Your Mother for pretty much the entire run? Or is that becoming more and more common? You talked about Pam Fryman? Yeah, like is it is it unique for her to be like she was basically the only director on How I Met Your Mother? Is that a unique situation or that's, does that happen a lot more now? No, that's a result of the format because a sitcom, which I actually did do years and years and years ago, is a very different format where there's a rotation of directors in episodic television because um you know, there's a lot of prep work. There's almost as much time allotted to prepping a show as there is to actually shooting it. When, you know, and prepping is casting, location scouting, you know, uh, working with all the department heads, whether it's props, wardrobe. Um, and for the most part, uh, a sitcom like How I Met Your Mother is more of a stage play that's being filmed by cameras so that you go through this very cyclical process starting on, let's just say Monday, where they table read, and then Tuesday, Wednesday, they um, they get up and rehearse and block it. And, you know, for the most part, the sets are mostly standing. They'll have some swing sets they might build for an episode, but they're, they're really just three wall sets. Then Thursday and part of Friday, they'll bring the cameras in and block it. And then Friday night, they'll shoot it. And then they'll start that process all over again on Monday morning. So it's actually possible that one director could do all the episodes but it, you know in one camera whether it's one hour drama or a half hour uh comedy um uh one director couldn't do it all now there are shows like a true detective which is a brand new model for the most part where one director will shoot the whole thing but in that circumstance to a degree it's a smaller order six eight episodes and for the most part, all the scripts have been written in advance. And so they're boarding it, breaking down the script, figuring out what they're going to shoot, how many days they have to shoot in this location, whether it actually plays, you know, this one pool hall could play in episodes one, five, six, and seven. And they'll just bunch all that together and shoot it all at the same time. But in that scenario, one, they treat it like one large movie. And that way, one director could do all at once. 
show you Wi-Fi how to do all that. Or, 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 or uh, because you guys froze again. <coughs> how are we now? Good. I can hear you, I think, but you're pretty digital. Okay. That's all right. Would it make a difference if we turn off the camera, our camera? No. <coughs> I think, I think okay. okay. Right. Other questions on um, ongoing production before we go to new stuff? Yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Ian. Um, and I was wondering is there a show on air right now that um, is a particular interest of yours or that you would want to direct for? Um. You know, it's funny, for the most part, I actually think there's some pretty spectacular stuff on the air right now. And, um, you know, I've been fortunate the last several years just to be doing pilots. And, you know, the big difference between a pilot and, and doing an episode of a show as a director is that you're literally, it's a little bit more like doing a small movie, that you're starting from scratch. You're casting it, you're designing the look of it, everything, wardrobe sets and everything. So that's been my major focus over the last several years. That said, you know, there have always been periods, there have been periods every couple of years where I'll just go do an episode here, an episode there, because uh, I like it, or it's friends of mine or something like that. Um, I think the best show on television, one of the best shows I've ever seen is Fargo. And if, yeah, go Fargo. <laughs> uh, but... Um, and we actually were that there was some discussion about that. We just couldn't make the schedules work out. <laughs> What's your favorite show? Um, I'm really enjoying Legion right now. Legion. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, I just want to do a quick go round. Uh, everybody answered Dave's question, so I didn't hear that. So just hey, like, what's your favorite show on TV right now? Favorite show on TV right now. Uh, well, I'm really, really psyched about the re-release, the reboot of Twin Peaks. So that, that can did you count. did you had you, seen, had you seen the original? Oh yes, yeah, several times. How did you how, <laughs> did, how did it come to your attention? Because I'm gonna guess it was created before you were born. Well, you guys all look great, but you're frozen. Mitch. Mom, Dad. Am I frozen? Hey, no, no, I gotcha. Okay. Well, hold on, stand, stand by for Aiden's answer. What was your question? Uh, oh, I'm assuming that the original was created before you I were was born. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Am I right about that? Yeah, I was three years old. How, how old, it, you know, that's funny. I thought it was a little older than that. I mean. I thought the original was like 1991. Oh, 92. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. So, so how did you become aware of it and start watching? Well, I, uh, I watched it on Netflix, but I just got introduced to it because I got obsessed with David Lynch. So that's okay. how that happened. Good. Cool. Just as you go around saying your name and favorite film, either on or anticipating that's what's going to be extremely. And I'm watching um, the new season of The Leftovers right now, which is. The Leftovers? Yeah. Nice. Okay. Hi. <laughs> I'm Taylor again. <laughs> I am in love with the uh, cinematography being done in Queen Sugar right now. I think it's beautiful, and the storyline is deep. I didn't hear what, what show? It's called uh, Queen Sugar. It's on its own. I'm sorry. It's really echoey. Queen. It's, it's called Queen Sugar on own on Oprah's network. Wow. I haven't even heard of it. <laughs> it's really good. You should watch it. That's awesome. <laughs> that's, just, that's just such an indication of how much, you know, Variety and, and just the abundance of content out there. That's great. Okay. My name's Danny. Um, I've been watching. Well, today I started a show on Netflix called Girl Boss. I don't know if I like it or not. Yes. <laughs> it's good. I guess. What's the show? 
Girl Boss, it's from Charlize Theron's company based on the book, based on the company, the internet company. Girl Boss. Girl Boss? Yeah. One word, Girl Boss. Just, just, just started on Netflix. Yeah. What network is it on? Six. Nice. Okay. <laughs> Um, I'm John Carlo. My favorite show right now is Mr. Robot. Yeah, it's a good show, isn't it? Yeah. Why do you, why do you like it? <laughs> Sorry? Why do you like it? Why do I like it? Um, I don't know. It's so dark. It is just so intricate. Um, it kind of reminds me a lot of Fight Club. And it's about like how cool society is and how it's uh, kind of controlled by big corporations, and I love that. Nice. Hi, um, I have to say my favorite show right now is Peaky Blinders. Um, I'm also really crazy about Ray Donovan. Hold on, Dave. Peaky Blinders. <laughs> Peaky Blinders. Oh, Peaky Blinders. <laughs> yeah. Is that what you said? Peaky Blinders. Yeah. yeah. Great show. Love it. Great show. Hello, I'm, I'm Jeff. My favorite show right now is on Netflix, Z Nation. It's like kind of a comedic comedy show. Post Post Z Nation. Z Nation. Z Nation. Z Nation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Nice. Hi, I'm Amira. Um, my favorite show overall right now is chewing gum but i'm watching grace and frankie and i'm like <laughs> i love that show i know not that it's already market but i have to say yes wait so wait you said uh, <laughs> frankie and grace doing chewing gum. Grace said chewing gum yeah chewing gum it's a british show on netflix british series now in its second season yeah. just started second season and grace and frankie yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Hi, I'm Jesse. Uh, my favorite show that's currently on, I would say, is Broad City, but I'm very. Uh, she just froze. Hey. Okay. Is there two? Mitch? I, heard, I, I think I heard her say Broad City, and then she started uh, emitting this high pitched. Uh, the new Amy Sherman Paladino show, The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. Actually, that's not a bad idea. Yeah. If we just do, if we mute and have to mute and just go, hey, Dave, yeah. just so we can hear you consistently through, I'm going to call, just mute your audio. We're saying I'm going to call you on your, should I call you on the house phone or your cell? House phone. House phone. Okay. Hey, Bob. <laughs>
That was really weird. But I don't have you guys back. Anyway, you know, Alex was just fantastic. And I really kind of used him. I think what I had worked with JJ before, but <clears throat> I had not worked with Alex. And, and, and I'd known Alex and Robert before. And, you know, they're no longer working together. And this is really Alex's show. And those guys obviously wrote together the two JJ Star Trek movies, which were, I, bought, I thought both were fantastic. And I really used him in many ways, Mitch. You know, I mean – it wasn't so much that I couched it in the way of, Hey, you've been through the gauntlet on the, you know, with the fandom and, 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 and what your experience been like. Um, it's been more that I used him as the ultimate barometer that he's sort of in my mind right now, the gatekeeper um, to the brand, you know, Roddenberry's Gene Roddenberry's kid, Rod was involved, but very, very, I mean, very nice guy, but very, very tangentially. And, there's a lot of people, you know, um, but but Alex for me is the ultimate barometer of, you know, if it passed muster, what what whatever whatever it is we were choosing to do on any capacity, and that was nice to have that. It was nice to have a guy who had, you know, been very foundationally involved in the reboot, and and I would argue along with JJ is the kind of the gatekeeper right now of the franchise. Yeah, that's true. Well, I, I mean, I think in answer to your question, yes. I mean, in some ways, I think your audience can answer the question better you know, with regards to what does an audience think they know, but I will tell you from the supplier's point of view, and it is really a project by project basis. You know, while David was doing, we were doing Goliath, he was also doing um, what's called Pretty Little Liars, the thing with Reese Witherspoon and Big, Big Little Secrets, Big Little Lies. That one over there has got a lot of personality, Mitch. I got her number. Um, uh, but I think, you know, in that, that particular case, Reese Witherspoon was a producer, and I think she put it together, and I think that was um, – that was, um, you know, a combination of a book and her and Nicole Kidman – and interestingly enough, um, and I didn't say it directly to David, but it was very interesting to me that as much as David was a part of the hook of selling trial to uh, Goliath to an audience, and understandably because his you know incredible history and success with legal based shows, they didn't lean on him at all in the press of pretty big little secrets, right? Do you even know that is? Big Little Lies? Yeah, and what your assets are. You know, we have a potentially really exciting name for the Spanish format. Um, but I think the, the general collective feeling of both the studio who's, who bought the property on my behalf and is, is my partner and the agency that's helping us sell it, their feeling is the, 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 the format is generating so much enthusiasm 
don't limit yourself because if we're in the process right now of trying to sell it to a bunch of different networks, network A may love this actor. Network B may think that that actor is not right for our network. So it really ultimately becomes a case by case um, circumstance. You know, the other thing I will tell you, I will tell you the other thing is, is and this directly relates to everybody in the class, um, it's, it's cyclical, but as we are bringing in um, different writers to discuss their take on the material, uh, the question of whether they would spec it or we would try to sell the show first has come up a lot. I'm assuming you know the difference between that. And in this particular case, twofold, because we have a pre-existing format that in, in, in the case of this thing, we literally can show three episodes the Spanish episodes that were translated. So we literally not only have the eight or 10 scripts, we literally have a couple episodes to show, which is a big hurdle, because it's a pretty compelling show. Um, and also, and so the, the, the agency is saying, don't spec it, you know, don't, you know, it gives the, the network or the potential, the, the, whoever the buyer is, an ability to be more creatively involved. Um, it means that the writer can get paid for doing their work rather than doing their work in advance, however many months or whatever it takes them to write. Um, and also at this particular time, given the success relatively recently of a number of specs scripts that went on to sell and become successful series, there is an absolute flood of spec scripts on the market right now that on any given weekend 20 specs are coming in that all the different networks have are having their junior level executives read and report back in on monday morning um that changes like i said that that's that's an ebb and flow um but right now uh at this particular moment specs are not are are, are not favored Um, no, not really. I mean, I, we were looking to originally, we were looking to some very big names in the beginning. Um, and I think, um, in that particular case, Mitch, if it made sense, and there are bits of bigger names that are coming on as the series is evolving, um, the 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 main, the main character was definitely more of a discovery kind of it just the, na the nature of the role it's much more of a discovery there is one role you know in uh, Michelle Lee Michelle Yeoh rather Michelle Yeoh that was a very big name internationally um, but uh, the 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 brand the, the brand itself the IP is so powerful it, it we didn't need it you. you Well, mostly, well, let me back up a second. I, I was, when they came to me with this, uh, having just had these really good experiences with Amazon and some Netflix experience, you know, I was really intrigued and I thought it was remarkably smart that, you know, CBS was looking at it, for example, your class and saying, they're not watching broadcast shows anymore. We better start getting into this streaming um, game. That may ultimately not be the case. It still may, as I've now been through a year with them on this, because of the way they're approaching it, it still may be just another way to attract viewers to their broadcast shows. I'm not 100% convinced yet. But taking it just at face value, I thought to myself, well, they're smart, they're dipping the toe into what I believe is the future. And why not do it with 
one of the most iconic titles of all time. If you're gonna, if you're, if you've been traditionally a free network, and now suddenly you're asking your viewers to start paying, that's something people are gonna pay for, right? Um, creatively, because it was a lot of the same people who had been, they didn't bring in new executives from the outside who had done this kind of work. They mostly relied on people from other parts of the broadcast part of the company. And so ultimately to answer your question, it was always a question of were they gonna be able to creatively think in terms of the differences between a broadcast show and a streaming show, or were, were they gonna be unshackled, or were they gonna, was it just gonna be too difficult for them to unlearn all the lessons that they've been um, and all the habits that have been forming over the, for a very long time, uh, frankly, you know, in the broadcast realm, being very successful. I'll get back to you on how successful I think they've done at that when it's all done. Well, what the, the, the game plan always was, uh, and I, you know, again, I don't know how much your class delves into the business of the business, but I'm assuming a lot of you like um, binging and that whether it's a show that is on a more traditional um, network, but that, that then it, when it's all done, it, 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 it's available after the fact in a streaming capacity where, you know, I know a lot, a lot of people will not watch it because they'd like to be able to control the consumption and they'd like to wait till it's all available. And I agree with that wholeheartedly. Then there's this other model, which they're following currently a little bit more of a Hulu model, Mitch, which is they're going to launch episodes per week, which is frankly a way for them to prevent people from paying one subscription fee, watching it all, and then discontinuing the subscription. It's a way of keeping the, the subscription alive, at least for a little while until they get the next thing out. Which, by the way, Jean Carl is talking about doing uh, Twilight Zone. I don't think it's just excited. Got a Twilight Zone T-shirt. That would be hey Mitch, hey Mitch, that would be awesome right now if he stood up, took off his jacket, took off his T-shirt, folded it inside out, and on the other side was a Twilight Zone logo. Um. Anyway. Uh, um. So, you know, and, and for me, there's a big question mark as to, I wasn't aware, frankly, when I joined on that that was the model that they were going with. And what that means is that we're still there, and there is still a commercial component to it. Again, more like Hulu, where every 15 minutes or whatever, you watch one commercial for 15 seconds. Um, and I do think there's, they're talking about having a different payment structure where you can actually skip those commercials, which is really interesting because having been involved in shows that were either, you know, traditionally at commercials and maybe we would do a special episode that was sponsored by one sponsor like we did in American Dreams and we did a full hour that was commercial free. If we're actually making content that is simultaneously needs to be delivered in such a way where you have commercial breaks, but also for some viewers can be um, watched straight through, you know, it's not just a technical delivery, it's also how you're dealing with it creatively. Um, no, I know that. I know that. And that, 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 I mean, it was, and by the way, when they talk about it at CBS, it's referencing Hulu as a, as a model.
Well, it's actually not a novella. It's I don't think it was a novella. Um, it's just a currently, and I don't even know, frankly, if it's limited series um, or what they plan on doing it. But it's basically this very. Uh, it's called "I Know Who You Are," um, and it's this very, um, in the best way, because soap doesn't always have to be a derogatory term. It's this very complex, character-driven kind of thriller uh, about a murder that's committed and a very high profile member of society who's accused um, and of, of killing, who turns out who is actually his niece. Um, and he claims to have amnesia. And he's a very high profile attorney that we then find out um, many times before he used amnesia as a means of getting off some of his clients from similar circumstances. Um, yeah, the design, the intention for me on that one is, uh, you know, I, I really like doing pilots. And although the notion of doing something like a true detective is very intriguing to me, um, it, it would have to be really the right, uh, the right, the right set of circumstances, the right material, you know, um, to want to do something like that. Well, I'm sort of doing both at the same time. So there's the whole part of my life that is about developing like this particular project, um, which, you know, as I said, the, uh, uh, a producer friend of mine who we had worked together before, we found this format that was being shopped around internationally and brought it to CBS with whom I had a deal at the time. And they, amidst a pretty heavy bidding uh, process, we won out over a bunch of different other producers or, or writers who had deals at other studios. Um, but I'm in a very sort of fortunate position where while I'm constantly developing things, which is a much longer road, I'm, I also get a lot of incoming calls about projects being brought to me. For the last several years, I've been at, at an overall deal at CBS, um, which basically consisted of me doing a pilot a year for them. Um, with a tremendous amount of flexibility on my part, you know, the, the, the traditional broadcast pilot season is the first three or four months of the year. And so my deal with them was that I would do a pilot during the first part of the year for them, that my development I would bring to them first to give them a first bite at it. Uh, and then the rest of the year I could do whatever I wanted. And that's how I was able to go do uh goliath and man the high castle those were in my off cycles and actually technically star trek was as well on top of the deal even though it was cbs it was it was the part of the year that was doing the 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 you know what, what i would always be hoping to do the streaming the the more um challenging material stuff I like where you're going. Uh, oh boy, that's a good question. Well, I would say really first and foremost, um, don't get fooled by the term showrunner. Uh, it's kind of a misnomer. And don't get fooled by the term created. It's also a misnomer. And don't get fooled, or actually don't undervalue the term writer. I think, you know, more and more there's been this movement towards um, looking for other ways of defining what uh, a person of your skill set does, which is, I think the most important and the thing that I idolize the most is when a person's a good writer. 
Um, and that's not to say that there aren't some who aren't visionaries and that there aren't some who are really truly gifted filmmakers. Um, but for the most part, the really great writers like David Kelly just writes and he, he has a lot of faith in the other people that he surrounds himself with. And sometimes I think there's a, this mistaken impression that when you go from being a writer to being a staff writer, to being a, one of the supporting producer writers, um, uh, that, that doesn't suddenly mean you have to tell the production designer how to design the sets. You know, I, and I feel this way as a director. Like, I always like to joke that I know just of enough of what everybody does in a production to be a pain in the ass. But, and, and, and I, I kid about that because I know more. But uh, the, 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 the truth is, is that I do know a lot about photography. But when I'm working with a cinematographer who spent his life devoting himself to that study of that craft, I'd be crazy not to listen to what his input or his advice on how to do something is. You know, uh, it's the great it's a great thing when you get into the position of a showrunner or, or a director where you sort of get to say, "Hey, you know, we're all here. I want to go there," and letting the people who really have the expertise tell you how to get there and then be almost more of an editor of ideas rather than feeling like you have to be the owner and the initiator of every idea. Because the great thing is, no matter whose idea it was, it says created by you anyway. Or in the case of me, it says directed by me anyway. Um, and I think it's about always remembering. And frankly, you know, I, I mean, Mitch, the, the word that is for me least often used but the most appreciated when I do is finding a showrunner who um, uh, expresses humility on a regular basis and is very strong in their opinions, very clear about what it is they want, but is also v just as equally clear and confident to convey the things that they don't know. Because there's a tremendous amount of people there to help you. Hundred percent, hundred percent. As a matter of fact, you know we're we're unfortunately on the verge of potentially another writer strike, and there have been a lot of conversations amongst people in the business, you know, writer friends, executives, and whether or not, you know, as is always the case, I think the writers deserve everything they're asking for. It's just a question of how they go about it, and you know, my basic contention is that there should be collusion between the directors and the writers and the actors. Um, and if they were truly all in cahoots, studios would have no position. There would be an absolute shutdown. And that's the only place to establish that kind of strength. Um, the problem is, I think the studios play upon the egos of the writers and the directors, and uh, they actively fuel the fire of the things that keep them apart. And in, this, in, in the case of the... Um, television, I think most writers that I come across, and they may be great writers, I don't think they deserve the term created by, but I don't think they deserve the term showrunner. That said, I know a lot of directors, and in the feature world, there are a lot of directors who don't deserve the term a film by. And it's 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 a one-to-one. -one. You know, every time that thing comes up in television, the request on the writer's guild is like, all right, directors, you get rid of the film by credit. And they're like, nope. And so it's a way of keeping animosity between two disciplines that really need each other more than they don't. Hey, hang on, Mitch, 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 hang on just two seconds. Right. Okay. I'll call you later. No, no, still going on. Sorry, Mitch. Jeff asked from where?
Yeah, I've sat on the, I've sat on the contract negotiation board. Uh, here's here's the problem. I, I've been having this conversation a lot over the last couple of weeks. I don't understand why the writers are striking. I I, I understand and agree a hundred percent with what they're wanting. It has historically been proven that nobody ever benefits a strike, and certainly not the people strike it. Um, and when I asked recently, I was at this DJ thing, and I asked the president of the DJ. I said, "Hey, how's it going?" And and uh, he said it wasn't looking good. And and I said. Can I ask you a question? I said, I said, is anybody on the upper echelon of the negotiating committee at the WGA, weren't they around 10 years ago for the strike? Because it was devastating. And and most um, – the, the, the Writers Guild will never recoup the money lost um, with contracts. You know, with force majeure, they're able to just do away with contracts, you know, or deals and whatnot. Uh, and he said, oh, yeah, there were a bunch of people there. It's just the problem is they look back on it and they think that the strike was a success. Which I think is a huge problem because it, it, it was not a success. And it was devastating to the business. And I think this one will be even worse given the, the change that's occurring right now. And, and the Right. It's hard to tell. I mean, you know, it changes from day to day. And that was a big thing. Look, they actually, the, the guild announced the date of the strike before they even had the authorization of the membership, which has never been done before. And I thought it was a wildly ballsy move on their part. Now, it turns out that the strike vote came in and they had like a 92% authorization. Um, so their gamble paid off. That's a pretty significant number to go to the studios with. And the question now is, is that going to make the studios respond? Um, I think, you you know, you know him. You're dealing with the Les Moonves and the David Geffens and the, I mean, some of the best negotiators uh, out there dealing with, a, no offense, a bunch of writers who don't negotiate for a living. This is what those guys do for a living. And I think they're going to, you know, it's a really risky position to be taking. Um, you know, and the other big, you know, when you, and, and I say the same thing all the time. Why is it? I think in the entire history of the guild, the get the right, the director's guild once for like 45 minutes, literally. Um, and I ask all the time, you know, and a lot of times what the writers will say, well, you know, it's different for the directors, you know, and, and, you know, talking about the, the numbers, you know, the way that um, it's weird. The writers always act like the directors did something wrong because they got a good deal. They're always angry at the director's deal because we negotiate. We start negotiating a year in advance um, and we don't get anywhere near the deadline. Um, you know, I also think by, the, by, by their nature, directors are problem solvers. Um, and that's literally what we go to do. I mean, writers do it. Absolutely, but they do it in a, in a much more cerebral, by themselves kind of way. Directors literally go to work and solve problems all day long with a hundred people. Um, but I also think what's a big difference, Mitch, is that the percentage. I, and I don't know the exact numbers, but I think the percentage of the directors' guild that's working is much higher than the writers, which is higher than the actors. The actors are the worst. And when you are, when a vast majority of your voting body is able to vote purely on philosophical or moral principles, it's much easier to be, uh, to take a moral stance when that's not really how you're making your living anyway. So why not? Why not stick your thumb in the nose of the big guy? And by the way, this is not coming from a person who has a love for studios. I'm just a little bit more of a pragmatist, I think. And I think there's other ways of going about, um, you know, fighting to get for what, again, I will always say, they absolutely deserve. Um, you know, for example, Mitch, 
Sure. I think that the reason that the, that, you know, all the guilds have three year um, contracts. I don't think it's by accident that they're each contract comes up a different year, but that's not to say that the writers can't say, you know what we're going to do? We're going to work, with, we're going to work without a contract for a year until the writers are ready until the director's contract is up. And then we're going to see what they do. See if we can't get into unity with them. Um, what's that? I'd love to see it. I'd love to see it. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm of the opinion that the studios don't collude until it's until they get to the point where they're they're all feeling like they're all paying too much money for all this whiny talent. And I mean that's and I include all of us in that. And then I'm like, you know what? Let's encourage them to strike. We'll play into their egos. We'll strike. We can force majeure all their contracts. And then we'll start all over again. You know, it's like when the five families, they have a little bit of bad blood. And they, they have a couple of blood in the streets for a little while. And then they clean up all the bad business and they go back to work. It's a great question. I think uh, the most exciting thing to me about streaming is that you remove the middleman and that stories are that the, the, the line of communication between storyteller and viewer is a direct lineage. So that first and foremost, it's not, yeah, the show's okay, but you know, it really is attractive to the uh, the demographic that buys my soap. So I'm going to keep it on the air because I want it to reach those people. That taking that middleman out is the best thing. And it literally is now because they the metrics are so specific and they and they can determine exactly who's watching it, exactly how long they're watching it, when they watch it, what they were wearing when they watched it. Um, it's now literally come down to the show actually has to be good to stay on the air. And so that is a basic premise. It's fantastic. The other big thing for me creative, and this was an early discovery when I started doing streaming. Um, and I just love this. I love this as a viewer as much as a, as a, as a filmmaker. Um, when you used to make a traditional network show, it was always about like in any company, you know, for that matter, what, um, what, uh, uh, how much is your audience growing each week, right? And as a result, what you needed to do was make tell, tell stories and create content that simultaneously worked for the people who had been loyal and had been watching your show over and over again and to people who might be coming new to the show. So that you I'm, – I'm glad you sat down. I thought you were leaving. Um and uh, and so you had this weird bifurcated responsibility as a storyteller. I think the single key, the single key to story, storytelling on film, and this whether you're a director, an actor, a writer, is literally about finding that line where you're intriguing your audience to come enough with you, but not giving them too much so that it's, you want to entice them, but you want to keep some mystery. You know, you don't want to, you don't want to tell them too much because, and if you fall on either side of that line, you're going to piss off your audience. You're either going so fast that they're left in the dust and they don't want to put up with you, and they, they haven't been given enough breadcrumbs to keep them moving forward, or you're telling them so much that you, they feel like you're, they're being pandered to. And it's like, come on, already, I got it. Let's move on to the next thing, right? So when you're watching a broadcast show and you've got people who've watched the first five episodes, 
and the sixth episode comes along and you are tasked with the notion of like, well, we got to keep showing the network that more people are coming to the show. So we got to make the show accessible in the sixth episode to people who've never seen it before. And all the while rewarding the people who have been with us for five episodes. Suddenly with a streaming uh, piece of content where if I see a show and I say, Mitch, I've been watching the show. It's incredible. I'm six episodes in. You got to watch it. Um, it's called Josh Plays for the NBA. You got to watch it. Yeah, see, I got one guy in the audience who's interested. Um, but uh, but, it, but if, if I say to you, Mitch, you got to watch this thing. In a normal situation, you say, okay, what night is it? I say, oh, it's on 8 o'clock Wednesday night. Great. I'll watch the next episode. Now, if I say to you, Mitch, you got to watch this thing, you're going to go back and you're going to start on episode one. And if, if someone's watching episode six, most likely it's because they've watched one, two, three, four, and five. And what that removes is any requirement on the part of the storyteller, writers first and foremost, but everything that follows that. Um, you no longer have to restate your narrative to make sure that the people who are new to the show are coming on board and that are following you. So there's a much there's much more freedom in the storytelling. You're allowed to move in just a purely linear fashion, um, and I think that's raised the stakes on the relationship between the storyteller and the viewer. And why it's not surprising, but it's also encouraging that when we ask everybody in class what their favorite show was, every one of them was a show that doesn't really cater to or have to adhere to that old model of making sure you're constantly bringing in new viewers. Totally. Yeah, and all, I mean, for me, Game of Thrones was a perfect example. I really wasn't that privy to, when it very when it first started, and I wasn't. I'm not a big fantasy guy, um, but I remember being about five episodes into that show, and thinking, I have no idea who these people are, but I love this show because the drama, and the 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 characters, and good versus evil was so clear. I mean, it was great writing. Um, but I didn't feel like I needed to know. I, I figured, they'll tell me. I'll figure it out. You know, um, it's much more of a feature approach. I never would have gotten, I literally was five episodes into that show, and I still didn't know what the hell was going on. But I didn't care. And I never would have gotten five episodes if, I never would have, I would never have made five Tuesday nights at 8 o'clock. Do you know what I mean? So I think it's, I think it's an incredibly exciting time. Uh, to be working, and you guys should all go out and kill Hollywood, crush it. <laughs> uh, well, that's a great question. I personally, I think, I mean, I'm always more interested in a, more of an ensemble. Um, you know, I did the Heroes pilot years ago, and I, and I kind of feel like we were a little bit ahead of our time in this way, but I made a real, real big thing out of making sure that the cast was uh, a very diverse cast. This is, you know, over 10 years ago now. And Part of it, because it was a it was a worldwide story that was happening. It was allegedly happening over the world, all over the world. And because the basic premise of the show was at a time where there were no heroes, we had no political heroes, we had no religious leaders, we had no you know entertainment or sports leaders. Everybody was getting caught on some sort of conspiracy. You know, the, the genius of that show was it was basically saying, okay, there are heroes out there, and guess what? You could be one of them. Um, and so I thought we should make it reflective of a larger audience that everybody should be able to identify with one of those characters, you know, 
whatever their ethnicity, whatever their gender, whatever their whatever was, you know. And I kind of always sort of feel the way about, again, both as a viewer, but as a storyteller, when you're trying to ultimately create even in a situation where it's 10 episodes a year, you want it to go for four or five years and that's 50 stories you've got to tell. And the more, you know, avenues of story to tell that usually goes in my preference through character, it's just more options. And you, you know, you want, you, you, you set out to do something. You don't really know how it's going to turn out. You think you do. You have an idea in your head, but it gets so wildly shaped by all the participants you bring into it. That's the other thing I would say about, you know, quote unquote, show running. Have a vision, but don't be totally invested in your vision. Don't be invested in the vision to the point where you can't receive the input from all the other creative people who are joining you on this journey. And I would the same, you know, I I would think I would say the same thing from a writing point of view. Um, you know, it, it it can be a big tapestry. You know, oftentimes when I'm looking for material or I look at other pilots, it's not just. I want, the, I want the pilot episode to be a great ride, but at the end of it, what I really want it to do is for me to see future stories and future interactions between certain characters. You know, when this character is established and that character is established, they have nothing to do with each other, but in my head, I'm like, you know what? Somewhere along those way, some along them in the future, those two characters are gonna have some sort of an interaction and that's gonna be awesome. And the more you see those sort of like narrative and character tentacles hanging and dangling and looking to be intertwined, to me, that's just a huge selling part of a pilot. You know, I think you sell your pilot in the first 10 minutes, first five minutes, um, but how you end it is, is equally important. Um, so... Mitch, Mitch, you 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 know I don't know how to read. I mean, people have to read scripts to me. I mean, come on, why do you want to do that to me in front of all these people? Um, I personally think that's a really slippery slope, and I think it's really dangerous. You know, what's funny when when Amazon look, we're the storyteller. I think you know one of the oldest recorded things is the notion of sitting around a fire and somebody telling a story not Schimberg, but somebody else. Um, you know, I mean, and, and there's a lot of people who always draw the comparison and why it's sad to know that cinema really is going to die as we know it, because there's a lot of parallel between, you know, people sitting around a fire and hearing the story of the kill that day, the, you know, Gothar who brought down the, bu the bison, uh, you know, and the flickering of the fire that's comparable to being in a cinema and the flickering images of a projector. Right. Um, but I, I was really concerned when Amazon announced they were doing this thing about voting on the pilots. And I'm still not convinced. Um, hold on two seconds, guys. Mitch, I'm, I am going to have to, there's a conference call that's about to start. Um, but but I, I'll finish that. Uh, hold on a second. Um, sorry, guys. Um, you know, and, and, and I, I will say, I, I will say, you know, I, I will finish, frankly, with this, which is, you know, we're the storytellers, and I think people want to be told stories. And, you know, on some level, I do think it's proven to be effective that if people feel invested and that they actually got this show chosen, um, you know, and if that's from a marketing standpoint of way of um, um, guaranteeing you have an audience when you launch this 80 hundred million dollar adventure you know um I, I i get it from that point of view but i i i'm still i'm not convinced yet that there's this and you know on all these different ir and ar things that i've been really participating in where there could be these multiple storylines i'm not convinced yet you know give me ar to so some guy in a, in a sitting by a computer can help me fix my 
sync, right? Uh, I can go into there and he can show me, you know, with augmented reality, that screw it this way. Um, but I, I, I don't know. I think, I think it's real dangerous to let uh, um, crowdsourcing uh, lead your story. I think, I think, you know, it, it's not to say that it's like anything. Use it as a resource, but don't use it as a crutch. That's my opinion. I think people should have a point of view. That's what people really get hooked into is somebody else with a really interesting point of view. I think I'll leave my life for 45 minutes or an hour or two hours and, and look at this guy's story. Look at this guy's experience was. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a huge advocate, but I'm old. What do I know? Well, awesome. Good luck, guys. Thanks for letting me into your class for an hour. It's cool to see.